Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by the fantastic Ricardo Martinez and Jerry, uh, my co-hosts, but much more importantly than us, uh, we have a great guest today, Econo Alchemist, uh, Monica online, sometimes burn the bridge, uh, a Bitcoiner who informs uh, others on things such as self-custody, censorship resistant, uh, mining at home, privacy, the list goes on. I'm sure there's much more to you. But um, how are you doing today, man, Econo? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Stoked to be here. Uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, so we're very happy to have you. And uh, I've got a question to start off hot right off the bat. I have no idea what your opinion is going to be on this, but uh, you can't ignore it. Uh, Bit for next hack occurred, uh, what, two days ago? Uh, oh, to, well, uh, the, the arrest occurred, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, not the hack, yeah, 2016, that was. The arrest occurred. I, I don't know what your what thoughts are on this, but we were just talking about it before you joined. You've got, you know, Tweedledum and Tweedledee uh, that have been making TikToks and cringy stuff and raps. But then you've also got, like, her making, like, pretty impressive, like, social engineering and manipulation speeches and presentations. So I'm a little bit unsure on this, but, hey, they got caught. Um, I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, you know, hey, uh, did, were these people likely the ones that did it? What happened? I mean, no one really knows, but I just wanted to see if you had any kind of initial speculative thoughts on this whole thing. You know, I'm, I'm still trying to take it all in and, and form an opinion on it. I'm, I'm pretty, I try to be pretty slow to, to form opinions on things. And man, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of information that like the floodgates just kind of opened when the news broke and there was a lot of info out there. And I, I think a lot of the, the um, different hypotheses they, they all kind of make sense. Um, I, I can see it from multiple angles. But, you know, at the end of the day, like those, those are the people that were arrested. And, um, you know, I, I think it's more likely than not that they actually were the hackers, um, it, it, as opposed to this being some sort of like elaborate cover up or some elaborate conspiracy. I think it just comes down to the truth being stranger than fiction sometimes. That's a pretty fair, fair answer. I'm kind of with you on that one, right? It's like we don't really know the full situation. There's tons of stuff getting leaked and you know it's like uh who knows what happens i think ricardo you were saying that you essentially thought more yeah like from, basically from the other side of the argument i heard those rap songs that she made and i find it extremely hard to believe that they were um they had the technological prowess to hack it in the first place and then the way they cashed out was so amateur it doesn't add up to me um whether they were like the the money launderers instead of the hackers as some people have put forth um, I guess that could make a little more sense. Maybe they weren't as as um, adept at you know doing things anonymously and stuff like that. But um, it to me something doesn't add up. It doesn't seem like they would be intellectually um, sharp enough to do it. Yeah, no, man. She's she's uh, she's joined. Uh, I think isn't it uh, Jay Z, Dr. Dre as as one of the billionaire rappers in the world, right? Uh, so right. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, that was a good. Meme. Songs are awful. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's an absolute nightmare, man. But um, no, I'll, I'll move on because obviously all we can do is speculate right at the end of the day. But I thought I had to bring it up. Right. It's too topical not to, to raise it. That is the, when it comes to yourself, I, I don't know, like if you want to introduce yourself or, but I suppose, like, hey, man, like what if you're at a, at a party or whatever, maybe not a party, an online party, because I don't know, whatever, and you've got to introduce yourself to someone like, hey, you know, this is who I am. This is what I give a damn about in the world. And like, this is why I give a shit about Bitcoin and like where, where that came from, how I came across this thing. Like, what would you say? Like, how, how would you introduce yourself uh, if, you, if you had to do it? You know, I, I would just start with, with what I like to do. I like to keep it pretty simple. You know, I, I try to have a laser focus on interacting with Bitcoin uh, through self-custody, uh, censorship resistance, keeping it permissionless. And, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that goes into that you know, like hardware wallets, steel backups, home mining, non-KYC, trading on biz, buying from an ATM, but like using a, a de-Googled phone with like Calyx OS flashed on it. So there's a ton of tools out there that can help people do those three basic things, interact with Bitcoin, using self-custody, keeping it permissionless and censorship resistant. And so, you know, I try to, I would I would just try and like pique their interest as to like what censorship resistance means and what kind of like 
problems that might solve for them. So, you know, I think people who have had financial hardships in their life tend to understand what's what the value proposition is behind permissionless, what the value proposition is behind censorship resistance. If you've ever had your wages garnished, where the state comes in and takes money out of your paycheck before it even hits your bank account, you understand the importance of censorship resistance by default. You know, if you've ever like had a loved one who's got an addiction problem and they are putting themselves in dangerous situations where there's cash in hand and drugs involved in person and they've been robbed at gunpoint or they've been harmed in that process, then you understand the importance of being able to make those transactions people don't want you to make in a safe way that's online and massively distant in geographic terms. So, you know, I'm talking about like buying on a dark net market or something. And, you know, if you've had a loved one that has drug problems, like, you know what it's like to see someone who's genuinely a good person, but just needs some help getting through the day. And you understand that person, um, you know, and if you um, have ever tried to like open a bank account and been rejected and haven't been able to have access to those types of financial services, or if you've been trying to run a, a business that just isn't aligned with your financial institution's moral compass, and you've had your bank account shut down and therefore have had troubles with your business, like that permissionless censorship resistance peer-to-peer -peer model really makes sense to people who have had problems with legacy finances. And you know, I think Bitcoin solves for a lot of those problems. Gotcha, man. I mean, that it gives an insight to the kind of guy you are. Like, clearly, you care about other people and like people's freedoms, right? I mean, so I was going to ask like why specifically you would care about other people being able to learn about like uh, mining at home and like privacy and using Calyx and things. But obviously, that kind of answers the question. Like, it's clear. I mean, uh, coming from someone who has firsthand experience trying to get a business going and then bank shuts you down, bank shuts you down, bank shuts you down, and it's a fucking right. nightmare. Spoke to Vlad Costia a while back and he's a big proponent of like decentralizing mining by having everybody like instead of running their own node like actually run their own miner at home and um he's like a big supporter of these like weaker asics they're not like the same asics that they use in big mining operations they're like smaller quieter ones that you could like run in your bedroom um what are your opinions on on mining at home and like what kind of machines is it that you run yeah, so like when I first started, I, I got like an industrial grade, uh, like a, a Watts miner M31S plus, which is, it was spec'd out at 82 terahash. So it's like the traditional ASIC that you see that it's as loud as a jet engine and as hot as a furnace. And um, so yeah, I plugged this thing into my home underneath my kid's room down in the basement and quickly had to figure out how I was going to deal with the heat and the noise and that kind of started the the whole like documenting process of the home mining article that that a lot of people have uh, found useful that I published but um you know to the point of decentralization yeah I mean there's products out there like Futurebit they make a device called the Apollo and that thing will hash like two to four tera hash and yeah I think it's absolutely great like imagine if we had like 10 million of those out there in the wild and you had that much hash rate being controlled by people that aren't going to get shut down if regulators clamp down on them. You know, like uh, what digital or uh, Galaxy Digital, that company, Galaxy Digital, they put out a report recently, just last month. And in that report, they had a prediction for the end of 2022 that up to 45% of Bitcoin hash rate is going to be controlled by publicly traded miners. And when I hear publicly traded, I think like susceptible to regulations, uh, they have to answer to investors. They can't just like go rogue and do whatever they want. It, they, they have to be careful because there's a lot of like venture capital and investment involved. And so when it comes down to like making decisions about what to do with that hash rate, are they going to prioritize the tenants of censorship resistance, or are they going to prioritize like what the investors want and, and maintaining that bottom line? You know, and I think it's going to be the latter, unfortunately. And so if it really came down to it, it, 
I think it could be a precarious situation where so much of Bitcoin's hash rate is in the hands of people that are more likely to comply if regulators start clamping down on these big miners. But if there's like a bunch of devices out there like the Apollo or these USB miners or just like even a S9 doing like 13 terahash, like the government's not going to be able to clamp down on 10 million users. You know what I mean? So I think it's very important for people to be hashing even if it's only a little bit, because every single hash that's produced has a equal probability of solving for a block. And as we've seen, there's been five really small miners this year that have solved for a block on that solo CK pool. You know, that's almost 32 Bitcoin that's gone straight from the network to individuals. I think that's a beautiful thing. What would you recommend for someone that's interested in getting started, like mining at home? Yeah, I, I would start small for sure. Start small and start simple. And, you know, think about what your living situation is. Think about like who you're living with. Do you have family? Do you have roommates? Are you in your apartment? You know, there's, uh, there's as many unique situations as there are people and there's not going to be like one solution that, that suits all of them. Um, but, you know, there are a ton of creative people out there coming up with awesome solutions every day. And those people are very happy to share their experiences on Twitter and on Telegram. There's a lot of chat channels you can get into and, and find some advice for people who are, for example, mining in an apartment and look at the kinds of things they have done to mitigate the noise and the heat that these industrial grade miners produce. You know, so at, the first thing I would say is just kind of think about your situation and what you want to do and what problems you're trying to solve. And if you think like a big, powerful miner is the answer for you, then, you know, the next logical step is to try and think about how you're going to mitigate the heat and that noise. Um, if that's too much, then yeah, you know, look at solutions like Future Bits Apollo or those, um, those USB sticks, I forget what they're called, like Gecko something, Gecko Science, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's simple devices out there that will run very quietly. They won't consume a lot of electricity. Um, they won't produce a lot of heat, but they will get you up and hashing and you'll be participating in the network. You know, you may never solve a block, but I think anyone who's interested in doing that at a really tiny micro scale is, is more interested in the ethos and the learning experience. Right. I guess also like, um, something you touched on when you said about, I think, was it 45, 42% uh, of the uh, hash, hash rate, et cetera, being with um, sort of, well, publicly traded uh, companies. Something um, that was brought up, and I can't remember who it was brought up by, but one of the guys we've had on recently, who's from a big mining company, uh, he was saying essentially that he, then- I think it was Charlie Schumacher from Marathon. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, Charlie from Marathon. It was like their estimation would be that basically energy companies would be the, well, people doing most of the mining, right? Because it makes a lot of sense. They've got all this excess energy or they're creating the energy and then they're going to want to be able to monetize it, do something with it. Uh, so he was kind of saying that. And then it kind of makes me think, and I guess at the time I hadn't thought about this, but then it makes me realize, well, shit, yeah, you know, you could get like 60, 70%, 40% of the hash rate basically controlled by what energy companies want. And that would be like the overwhelming thing and it kind of just sounds like the u.s political system where like whoever donates gets what they want it's like well whoever owns the energy companies it kind of just feels very centralized so i guess the the overwhelming thought in my mind is like well the best way to get around that is to participate even if it's just as you say like a small small amount and if enough people realize and do that then it helps take away that sort of centralized power i suppose so that's like another Beyond the learning and the, and the kind of ethos, it's more like, hey, you know, if you want Bitcoin to actually remain useful and your personal investments to remain good financially, the selfish reason is to start mining for that purpose. Do you see, uh, you spoke about like the heat generation and the sound. Like, did you, uh, I saw something on Twitter, I don't know, maybe like a week ago or two, uh, this guy who'd uh, um, like re rerouted the heat generated by his miner to like warm up kittens outside, like stray kittens in like a thing. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it, it was awesome. And, you know, that just go, that ties into what I was saying about the creative solutions. You know, people are coming up with all sorts of awesome ways to help, like, reduce their power consumption in other areas, like heating their home. And, you know, some people are, are donating their heat to kittens outside. <laughs> As someone who's never mind, like, how much heat are we talking about? Like, if you had it in your room, 
would it make your room uncomfortably warm like in, after a short yeah time? yeah so when when i first got my my first asic and fired it up it was in a room like a standard size room maybe like 12 feet by 10 feet and after about an hour the room it had heated up to 80 degrees and that was just going to keep accumulating so the the output fan of the asic is running about 150 degrees fahrenheit so it, it's a pretty substantial amount of heat you know it's um the energy used is like a, a one-to-one -one ratio with the heat produced so like imagine like a 3000 watt space heater that's equivalent to what the ASIC's going to produce in heat i guess uh, a question which i don't know i mean it's kind of pulling away slightly from mine but not really um we've kind of discussed we've mentioned why you should give a damn as a human being, uh, basically, even if you're being selfish, uh, in, in mining, uh, what obviously privacy is, an, is another, like a big impact for you. Like you, you mentioned people like getting, um, oh God, my words, uh, Google device, Google phone, I can't remember what it's called now, the Google, the Google phone, whatever it's called, uh, and using Calyx, uh, flashing Calyx onto it, uh, things like that. So I suppose my question here, because we've spoken to a few privacy advocates about this before, like, what do you think needs to be done to encourage more people to give a damn about their privacy when it comes to like Bitcoin transacting, but just also in general, like, cause it feels to me like uh, a lot of people really don't care until they, something really impacts them in their personal lives. Like, right. I guess like, is there anything that comes to your mind? Cause obviously you've been doing this for a while, like writing about it, trying to help people. Like what do you find is something that actually causes people to, to care without them having some, horrible life experience that then kind of forces them to care yeah you know unfortunately i, I think you hit the nail on the head and it, it's not until people need it that they they realize the benefit of it and they just kind of brush it off in the in the meantime or they they put themselves in the state of mind of like this defeatist mentality where it's like well i don't have anything to hide i don't really care i don't really care if google's scanning my photos that i have uploaded to the cloud I don't really care if they're reading my SMS text messages, you know, and it, it's not until something drastic happens that, that they realize what the risks are, you know, and um, even though people, privacy advocates, myself included, will try and like scream about this from the rooftops and like try to warn people about the red flags, a lot of times I'm just greeted with like, oh, that's FUD. You're just, you know, you're just an anarchist who who's fudding like just let people do what they want to do there's there's no major consequences and little by little you know i, I think they're all going to find out you know the, the especially as like cancel culture gets um into full swing here like look at what's happening with like joe rogan you know and it's it's like you can watch that happen to other people but at a certain point like it's going to happen to you you're going to wind up on the wrong side of that pendulum one of these days and it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when and it's going to happen to everybody you know and it, it's like just look at what's happened with the pandemic and they're trying to take away the your own bodily autonomy like you no longer get a choice of what gets injected into your body or at least they don't want you to have that choice anymore they want the vaccines to be forced upon you and so if you think that that can happen uh and something as minimal as like refusing banking services to a person who's not fully vaccinated isn't going to happen. You're just kidding yourself. Like the, this, the wheels have been set in motion. They have been for many, many years. And it's just a matter of time before you find yourself canceled, you know, and then, and then what are you going to do? So I just encourage people to really think about like, you know, what, what do you value? Do you value being able to communicate with your family? Do you value being able to have access to your money? Do you value being able to like move freely? If these are things you value, like start taking precautions, start taking measures, start making those little incremental steps today to start protecting the things that you want because there's an entire world encroaching on your freedoms. And it's not going to stop. It's just going to keep going and keep going. And you need to make a decision where you're going to draw the line. And wherever you draw that line, like you need to be prepared to guard that line and 
fortunately, we're all able to communicate with each other pretty well right now and share all these awesome privacy tools that are out there and help people like figure this stuff out and incorporate it into their like good habits and start building good privacy practices. Um, but you know, one, like what happens when my account gets censored from Twitter, you know, like there goes an audience of 20,000 followers that I can no longer talk about privacy with, you know, what happens when I get expelled from telegram, like there goes all the channels I'm in, you know, and it, it can happen and it has happened. And I think it's going to continue happening. 